Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon here in the room and on the live stream. And of course, welcome to our panelists here today. You're joining a press conference at the 47th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos, just in case the very subtle branding in the back hasn't given it away yet um, the, from where we're, uh, we're sending live. Um, the topic of this press conference is accelerating reforms in the Arab world. Um, I think everybody would agree a lot of bad news came out of the region in recent times, so it's good to hear something uh, constructive, something forward-looking, and that's what we're trying to do here today. Um, in order to do that, I'm joined by a wonderful panel of experts and strong voices from the region. Um, but first of all, uh, to my immediate left, I'm joined uh, by Marek Duzek, who's the head of Middle East and uh, North Africa, and also a member of the Executive Committee of the World Economic Forum. Right at the center of the panel, uh, we're joined by Imad Najib Fakuri, who is the Minister of Planning and International Cooperation of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And last but definitely not least, we have a strong private sector representative here with us today. It's Majid Jafar, who is the CEO of Crescent Petroleum, based in the United Arab Emirates. Thank you very much for being here. Um, Merrick, let me start by handing the floor over to you, and then I'd like to invite you to share with us um, what is behind this accelerating reforms in the Arab world, but maybe first of all, what is the World Economic Forum doing in the Middle East with public and private uh, sector uh, partners in the Middle East? Thank you. Thank you, Georg. Um, first, let me say that I think we're uh, working on the region at a very uh, critical time, very exciting time. Um, as you all know, there are uh, a lot of uh, uh, economic reform efforts in a number of countries in the region. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, in uh, other uh, Gulf countries, in countries like Jordan, uh, Egypt, Tunisia. And I think you have seen in many of the sessions here from the different protagonists um, uh, about this momentum or you've heard from them about this momentum. Very, very uh, welcome, I think, in terms of uh, building uh, new foundations for, for growth and development. Um, the World Economic Forum, we um, work with the private sector, we work with government, we work uh, with civil society. Uh, my partners here are uh, representing uh, government and business, and uh, this is what, how the forum works. We uh, make sure that um, uh, we really generate new opportunities by uh, um, f uh, focusing on this kind of dialogue. Now, concretely, what we've seen, of course, is that uh, growth and development is connected to stability, and so the World Economic Forum is working um, on um, uh, facilitating uh, diplomatic dialogues uh, here in Davos as well as uh, throughout the year. Uh, and, uh, but we try to help with the economic uh, reforms as well and this is why we are, why we are here. And so concretely, um, uh, Majid, who is here on, on the panel, will talk about uh, one outcome uh, that uh, we've had over the past year through working with a group of uh, business leaders uh, uh, representing different companies uh, in the region, uh, really looking at some of the practical low-hanging fruits in terms of uh, supporting uh, some of the government efforts uh, that we see uh, around the region. And, and then, of course, I'm very excited to have uh, Minister Fakhouri with us here because uh, the World Economic Forum will be holding a uh, the 2017 uh, Davos for the Middle East, if you will, in Jordan. We'll be returning to Jordan um, uh, and uh, we'll be there uh, May 19th to 21. And uh, again, it could not be a more critical time. Uh, we will be talking about how do you get uh, private sector as well as international uh, finance corporation or financial corporation more active. Uh, in uh, countries uh, that may seem fragile but yet need the support of those institutions and private sector entities to, uh, uh, to support growth and development at a critical time. But we'll be also talking about, of course, uh, how we can uh, further help with uh, some, of the, uh, some of the more uh, crisis regions and we expect, for example, a very fruitful dialogue on uh, uh, reconstruction of Syria. So what is the uh, what is the uh, future for Syria and how can we, uh, of course, not to uh, disturb the political process, but how can we already uh, make some 
um, uh, smart thinking about what is required in terms of public-private cooperation uh, for that country in particular. Um, finally, let me just say that we have had, um, as the World Economic Forum, also a long track record on working on youth unemployment. So this is something that we've actually worked on for a number of years, and, and uh, uh, we have been able uh, to enable the private sector get more engaged on, in an era that frankly used to be uh, quite close to private sector initiative. And so you're seeing more and more that companies feel, number one, responsible to uh, deal with the youth unemployment question. And concretely what we are doing is we are helping uh, uh, companies to um, skill people for jobs. So we talk a lot about uh, the fourth industrial revolution here. And so how do you skill uh, young people for the jobs of tomorrow uh, that can then bring additional competitiveness uh, to the economies in the region? This is uh, at the core of this effort. So uh, we really look forward to uh, discussing all these issues uh, in May in Jordan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Merrick. Minister, let's uh, move over to you and let's hear uh, the, the public sector uh, voice. But also, I think you have something uh, interesting to announce. Uh, it's no secret that the World Economic Forum and, and, and Jordan have a very strong and long-standing relationship. So I think you have some exciting news about what's going to happen later this year. Um, absolutely. Thank you. It's a great uh, pleasure and honor to be here with all of you. Um, uh, Jordan is very honored to, to host uh, now for the ninth time uh, the Middle East and North Africa um, World Economic Forum at the Dead Sea uh, from 19th to the 21st uh, May. Um, the meeting will be held under the patronage of His Majesty King Abdullah II um, Ibn al Hussein and uh, in partnership uh, with the King Abdullah II Fund for Development in Jordan and the Jordanian government. Um, the theme uh, is going to focus on enabling a generational transformation. Um, we are uh, very much uh, a region in 2017 at a very critical uh, juncture, uh, politically, economically, socially, um, uh, industrially, and in terms of uh, technology. Um, we're looking um, and hosting this meeting to address different themes and sessions that will focus on the ongoing geopolitical uh, shifts. And there are some critical transitions that are taking place in the region that I'm sure the media is very much uh, following up on. The humanitarian challenge and uh, how do we move towards uh, cessation of conflicts in many countries, a move towards political processes and diplomatic tracks, and try to move into uh, stabilization and economic reconstruction. Um, we have uh, a, a, a critical set of countries that are going through these transitions, and we have uh, another set of countries that are doing very well, uh, very stable, uh, 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 with tremendous opportunities uh, going forward. Still, this is a region that has a very big youth bulge. We need over the next 10 years to worry about creating 100 million jobs uh, at a minimum. Um, so uh, there is tremendous challenge, but at the same time, a tremendous opportunity. Um, we look forward uh, to working very closely with the World Economic Forum, with the private sector in our region, to press ahead with the reform agenda, um, uh, and to make sure um, that we address the different uh, transformations, the political ones, uh, the diplomatic ones, the economic ones that have to take place. Um, we're going to look uh, also at the fourth industrial revolution, what it means to the MENA region, um, how to empower gender and youth, uh, startups, entrepreneurship as critical uh, avenues, and reforming overall education and human resource development in the region, which is very critical to uh, deliver on the um, uh, transformation, the generational transformation, which is the main theme um, um, of this uh, meeting in May. And um, we are very privileged as Jordan to also showcase some of the great reforms we are doing and some of the great reforms that some of our colleagues in the Gulf Cooperation Council and some of the North African countries um, are implementing um, on the business side, on the economic side. Um, in spite of the conflict you see in the region, this is a region that has tremendous potential 
uh, incredible uh, business opportunities. Um, and the reconstruction potential now that is coming up over the next 10 to 15, 20 years is going to be massive. So the, the region is well positioned to hopefully, uh, once we get the political minimum stability, uh, start going towards uh, uh, opportunities to help the region uh, uh, reconstruct and move forward in, in a positive uh, trajectory. So um, uh, we look forward to hosting as many companies and uh, business and political leaders in May um, to uh, look at a very critical year uh, for the globe in terms of the Middle East and North Africa transitions that will be taking place. And we look forward to hosting all of you there um, uh, in May. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Majid, um, you're not only a uh, senior business voice from the region, but you also have taken the leading role with the Regional Business Council of the World Economic Forum. Uh, in both your roles, um, I'd like to invite you to present the findings of the report we're, we're, we're launching. And let me get a copy um, for the benefits um, of our online audience as well. And for everybody in the room, we have, we have copies for you here. Um, so um, feel free to, to take a copy, but without further ado. So thank you very much, uh, Georg. It gives me pleasure to represent the Regional Business Council of uh, the Middle East, North Africa. We're close to 40 companies now, leading companies from across the region in different sectors who are very uh, active, both with the World Economic Forum uh, and more widely in their regions and in their activities on tackling some of the key uh, issues. We started, as uh, Mirak mentioned a couple of years ago, looking at what can we do uh, to help with this key issue that we have of youth unemployment in the region. Uh, as you know, it's 30%, the highest percentage in the world, uh, and it's fundamentally caused by insufficient investment growth, uh, rigid labor markets, and an education skills uh, mismatch. But what can we do as the private sector and set up? So we set a target of over 100, helping over 100,000 young people. Uh, we exceeded that target. We're close to a quarter of a million now and we're aiming really to help with one million, and different companies are doing it in different ways. Uh, for our company, it was uh, English language training, which is seen as a key employability factor, and providing that through uh, online courses, uh, MOOCs, uh, and we've been doing that across the region and in the countries in which we uh, operate, from Egypt to Iraq uh, and others. And the next step really became, uh, what do we need as the private sector in the region. And that brings us to today's report. As you know, with oil prices half what they were uh, at the peak, uh, even though they're twice what they were a year ago, uh, government budgets are strained, uh, and the governments in the region are no longer able to just keep uh, employing the young people in, in the public sector, and it's no longer, uh, it's not necessarily productive employment. So the governments are, s are calling on the private sector in the region to step up and absorb more. Uh, and the pr this is really the private sector saying, you know, we're absolutely uh, keen to do that, but there are some key basic reforms which are required, regulatory reforms. These are not generational things. We need to, reg uh, you know, change our commercial legislation framework, education, and other things. That could take a generation. But these are some key things. And this came out of uh, a long process of, workshops and interviews and interactions with academic leaders, business leaders, and experts uh, on the region. So this is not something that was written by a consultant working alone in a room. This is really came out of engagement. Six key areas that, that we feel as the private sector could make a real difference. And the report includes papers that were written by business leaders, members of the Regional Business Council. So again, not written just by the forum staff, uh, who are great, by the way, but, <laughs> but this is uh, uh, you know, written actually by the CEOs from the region and other experts uh, from uh, the region, either former ministers or, or people working on IFIs uh, on the region, uh, who contributed these papers. So I'll just go through the, the six er uh, key areas which together we're calling the Actionable Policy Reforms Initiative, or APRI, because as you know, the forum likes its acronyms, uh, and I'm proud to be chairing this. So number one is enhancing the efficiency of the labor market, some basic regulatory improvements that can 
enhanced labor mobility, and that makes a huge difference in, uh, in tackling youth unemployment in particular and enabling the young generation to enter uh, the market in the first place, which is really the most challenging step, is getting on the employment ladder. Second one is uh, bankruptcy laws. There is no point calling for entrepreneurship when in many countries in the region it's a criminal offense to bounce a check, uh, let alone to bankrupt a company. Um, and many countries in the region, UAE and Jordan and other others, have, have taken some key steps in this area. It, um, third one is simplifying the process of creating a company. Uh, again, capitalism can't be expected to work when it can take a year sometimes and up to 90 processes for some countries in the region just to register a company, a process that usually happens online in 15 minutes in many developed uh, you know, countries. And again, this and other areas is where the fourth industrial revolution and the use of technology can bypass traditional processes and accelerate beyond or even you know, the normal uh, traditional development pathway. Fourth one is strengthening the capacity for reinforcing contracts through creating a special administrative units between the private and public sector to ensure that projects of national interest like key infrastructure projects are seen through without hiccups. The fifth is building functional mediation and arbitration methods. Many of our courts, unfortunately, it can take decades or you know, certainly many years uh, to enforce commercial uh, disputes or resolve commercial disputes. That adds a huge cost to capital uh, and inhibits investment from the private sector and therefore growth and job creation. So, so there are ways to get around that through the right commercial mediation arbitration methods. And sixth and finally is systems of good corporate governance and transparency, which are again key. There's been a lot of progress in the region, but this is an area uh, of key reform, again to enhance uh, the impact and ability uh, of the private sector. So I, I encourage you all to uh, look at the report. Um, and it's fundamentally about our need to transform our economies and create more job creators and not just job seekers. Uh, and we look forward to building on this momentum between the private sector and the public sector using the unique multi-stakeholder platform provided by the World Economic Forum. Beyond Davos, through to some regional uh, meetings we'll be having, uh, and all the way through to the regional summit uh, in May, inshallah, in Jordan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Majid. And, and Mirik, before he makes more jokes about the forum staff and our acronyms, um, I have uh, a second document I can wave alluringly at everybody here in the room and at our audience, but maybe Mirik, you want to give some context on, on this initiative here that we also wave it. Oh, you can also <laughs> wave it, yes, please. Um, <laughs> no, uh, it's, uh, it's um, something that excites us quite a lot because it's uh, for the first time that we are in a very structured way bringing together uh, the World Economic Forum community, which is of course uh, the top leaders from the private sector, from the public sector, from civil society. And we are inj injecting the energy and the thinking of the best startups from the Arab world. And so uh, we're proud to announce that in Davos, um, uh, we uh, signed a partnership agreement with the International Finance Corporation. Um, the CEO of the International Finance Corporation will be also one of the co-chairs of the meeting in Jordan. And together we'll be bringing, we'll be selecting first and then we'll be bringing uh, the best 100 uh, Arab world startups. Why we're doing it, um, of course in itself uh, this will be a tremendous opportunity for these emerging companies to connect uh, with uh, uh, the incumbents, but the main reason really is uh, to uh, provide new thinking uh, about economics and about uh, industry in the region. Will be very practically imagined that we would be putting um, someone uh, from uh, from a fintech company. Uh, at, at the steering wheel, if you will, of a discussion with finance ministers uh, and uh, uh, incumbent CEO, uh, CEOs of banks and having him or her steer a discussion about the future of finance uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, which is, by the way, as many of you know, uh, one of the core industries in the region. So what we expect is that this will really positively disrupt uh, some of the discussions uh, about the future of the region and will prepare it better 
for uh, the fourth industrial revolution or uh, will enable it to be more proactive and really reap the benefits of the technological change uh, uh, that we are seeing all around us. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a microphone here. If there's any questions from the floor, let's open it. Yes, we have uh, two questions over there. Let's start with the lady in the first row, please. If you could state your name and organization sure. for the sake of our online audience, sure. please. Najla Habrili, Sharq Al-Awsat newspaper in London. Um, I was just listening to um, another session on Arab economies with Prime Minister um, of Tunisia and other panelists, and I'm listening to you right now, and I do feel that there's a consensus among the political elites and economic elites in our region that um, the main challenge ahead of us is the fourth industrial um, revolution, how we can sort of incorporate these technological changes into our economies. My question is, one of the main pillars of um, you know, incorporating um, uh, the fourth industrial um, revolution is education. So um, I was wondering how we could reform effectively our education systems, knowing that in the Arab world we do have a lot of reforms of education that usually do not really turn out so well. So how can we um, make it happen this time? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's take the second question from the gentleman as well, and then we... Thank you, Gideon Kutz, RTB2 Israel. Uh, to Mr. Fahouri, uh, what, in what stage is the, this famous p project of uh, the Dead Sea, Red Sea Channel uh, was encouraged by, uh, by Mr. Paris, uh, especially now after his death? What is this, uh, the situation of this project? Thank you very much. So we have a question on education, the role of education, and how reform can contribute to better outcomes there. And we have the second question on the, on the right side, please. Sure. Um, uh, in Jordan, we're extremely proud as a country with very little uh, natural resources that we've uh, always had the mantra, uh, this, uh, the, the citizen or the human being is the most valuable resource we have uh, historically. And so we've invested heavily in, in education, but of course there's been some lapses in, in recent uh, years. And, and this is why um, last year there was a very strong uh, push through a public-private uh, partnership platform to relaunch a new uh, strategy for human resource development over the next 10 years. And it's very much uh, the type of strategy that stops uh, segmenting education to uh, high school and elementary and basic education and then technical then university but to look at it as a full value chain uh, for an integrated model of human resource development um, and we've adopted uh, this nationally it's been uh, part of the uh, uh, platform of the new government uh, post the uh, parliamentary elections in September and uh, winning the vote of confidence was based very much on having this as an anchor transformational uh, reform agenda uh, that the government has committed to implementing um, and uh, I presume you know very well that the challenge of having to create hundred million jobs over the next ten years means that many of the countries which had originally faced instability in our region was very much uh, instability because of not creating enough jobs for the youth um, so uh, the threats are real um, and uh, the countries of the region have to take this reform agenda very seriously. And for those that uh, don't, I think is, uh, there will be some serious repercussions. Um, um, so uh, we're uh, going to share our bold initiative uh, within the, the MENA um, World Economic Forum uh, uh, meeting in May, and there's other countries that are doing some incredible reforms in this uh, arena, and, and part of this is exchanging experiences and pushing for more public-private partnerships to uh, look at uh, innovative uh, approaches to, to reforming education. So um, you're absolutely right. I think this is the single most important uh, transformational agenda reform item for the MENA region, is to completely change uh, the way we do human resource development across the region. And it has to be receptive to the private sector needs. Uh, and, and, and that's why the, that partnership is going to be very critical. On the um, Red Dead conveyance project, and uh, I, I urge not to use the word channel because it's not a channel and it's a, it's a misleading word. Um, um, I'm, I'm pleased uh, to inform you that the, the Red Sea Dead Sea conveyance system is under international tendering, actually, by Jordan. We have qualified now five international consortia to develop the project on a, a BOT basis through a public-private partnership. We have one of the best companies in the world competing 
with a consortia of companies to deliver this Jordanian project with regional beneficiaries that will provide water for Jordan as well as for Palestine and Israel in a regional cooperation framework given that uh, water is a, is a very critical uh, challenge facing our region in spite of uh, what we see across our region. So I'm, I'm pleased to say that the, the, the project is progressing well and we just held uh, last December in Jordan at the Dead Sea actually, an international donor conference that has generated over $400 million of additional support that would come to the project uh, to support uh, the private sector BOT um, uh, component. The project is basically a desalination plant in Aqaba, um, an offtake agreement by the government of Jordan to buy all the water. That's about a 700 or a $650 million project that will be done through your normal BOT uh, transaction. Um, and then rather than putting the, uh, uh, the brine water back into the Red Sea, we're gonna convey it and pump it to the Dead Sea with some seawater and help then stop the Dead Sea from losing about a meter a year, um, which is a very critical uh, touristic, economic, uh, heritage, cultural, biblical site uh, on every possible level. As you know, Jordan is the second poorest country in the world um, in terms of water availability. We dropped to second after being the fifth because of the massive influx of uh, refugees over the past five years, specifically from Syria. So for us, uh, the water issue is a, is a resilience issue, is a national economic security issue. Uh, but the good side to this that uh, the political will is there to move this project. The international community is very supportive. Um, and we're at the tendering phase now of, of the project. Um, and uh, uh, this is one unique project that ticks all the right boxes. It's an important national resilience project for Jordan. Um, it's an important regional economic peace project for Jordan, Palestine, and Israel, because it will provide water resources for Palestine in the West Bank and Gaza, as well as to Israel in the South. Um, uh, and it will allow us to develop the entire Jordan Valley, um, uh, an area that uh, uh, would be able to absorb uh, industries and, and investments and, 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 and job creation activities over the many decades to come. Um, and uh, phase one of this project is anticipated to be about $1.1 billion. Um, I will point out that Jordan has been very successful in using PPP schemes, public-private partnership, over the past 10 years we've had over $10 billion of uh, public-private partnerships to deliver infrastructure in renewable energy, in uh, uh, energy, in transport, in um, water, wastewater. So we're accustomed to doing these types of projects. And I, I, uh, I mentioned that uh, we're an economy of about $38 billion. So when you do over 10 years that amount of infrastructural projects using the private sector, uh, that's a tremendous, uh, actually, uh, success story uh, given, uh, you know, the modest and financial resources that, uh, that, that Jordan has. And we've compensated for this challenge by actually using public-private partnerships to deliver on infrastructure uh, in a very uh, uh, successful win-win approach. I just wanted to say something about the education and skills. It's absolutely required and it's a generational uh, challenge. It takes time. You know, our region is almost unique, uh, not completely, but almost. There are some other, uh, but you know, parts of the world, southern Europe, maybe parts of Africa, but by and large across our region, we have more and more unemployed graduates and companies still saying that they can't find the talent. Uh, so there's obviously a mismatch there. Um, in fact, in North Africa, you're three times more, like, more likely to be unemployed if you have a degree. So th something is really uh, going wrong with the whole education system. As the private sector, we've tried to answer not what needs to happen overall. Well, we're, we're engaged on that too. In the oil and gas sector, for example, we're, we're engaged in an initiative uh, here from the forum to engage with universities on designing the curriculum that we need uh, for the graduates to hire. But in the meantime, the three top things for employability for young people, it's been shown, English language skills, IT skills, and what are called workplace skills, which usually comes from some work experience, but the ability to work in teams, communicate, and so on. And these are things that we can tackle now. And, and so through online courses and providing internships, uh, going back to the new vision for Arab employment, 
the hundreds of thousands that the companies of the regional business councils, uh, we're trying to tackle exactly these issues. Uh, that aside from the education system, how can we make s get some quick wins to help young people enter the job market? Thank you, Merrick. I believe you want to add to that. Yeah, on the education picture, um, fully agreeing with Majid. I think there is this aspect of women empowerment um, in this as well. And uh, as you know, uh, uh, if you look at statistics <coughs> in terms of achievement, academic achievement at universities, um, um, there are outstanding uh, 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 women, uh, or I think the rankings of women uh, in academics uh, tend, to, uh, tend to exceed those of men. But then you have it lost when it comes to uh, when it comes to the transition to the workplace. And so what we are seeing obviously is that with technology, you see that in a number of countries, um, uh, maybe adding to the workplace skills now, of course, virtual working, and, and the fact that uh, more and more uh, women are able to access work through technology is something that is really changing uh, uh, the landscape, and I think it's a great opportunity. Also should be mentioned that uh, the region and the governments in the region are actually one of the biggest spenders on education. So, uh, of course, the, the, uh, the challenge here is to provide quality education and giving access to quality education for future uh, competitiveness. And so here, again, technology is quite important. Uh, we're seeing the emergence of new entities on this, um, on this front. You may have seen the emergence of al Ghorer Foundation, for example, recently in uh, the UAE, where they have quite an innovative approach around using uh, technology to um, help uh, vulnerable young population to access some of the top uh, content that is out there academically. So we would expect that uh, uh, platforms like this will continue to emerge in the region. Thank you very much. We have one question from Frank here. Um, please. Hi, thanks. Um, Frank Kane from the National Newspaper Abu Dhabi. Um, the, uh, the six reforms that you uh, uh, propose or uh, uh, advocate, uh, they all seem so obviously common sense, don't they? Um, but they haven't been introduced across the region generally in the past. And with many of them, you know, looking through, there would be resistance uh, uh, to some of those changes. They, they uh, uh, all involve some element of social change as well as uh, economic or legal change, don't they? You know, with, with the first one to enhance the efficiency of the labor market, that's, that's the kafala system you're talking about. Uh, uh, with the second one, um, uh, uh, there you're talking about de decriminalizing bouncing checks again, which is another issue that's, you know, that has caused, caused a lot of problems. I mean, ev even in the UAE, which is, I, I, I would imagine, more advanced on these measures than some other parts of the region, uh, uh, there, there is some quite serious, stiff opposition to these kind of changes. So, s sorry, long way around to the question. Why haven't these things happened before? Thank you, Frank. So, <coughs> so... Some some of them are, or should be, more straightforward than others. And uh, for example, registering a company, and the UAE has made big strides in automating that or putting more of that process online. Uh, other countries, not so much. On the first one, efficiency of labor market actually wasn't so much the kafala system. It, w it was more about some of the larger population countries in the region outside the GCC, where it's more Europe Southern European style labor regulations, where there's real stickiness and the ability to hire and fire and people to move be between jobs. And it's been shown whether looking at Germany and comparing um, what Germany did to what a lot of the Latin countries in, in, in Europe uh, didn't do, and, you, and you'll see the impact of labor market reforms. Um, and in, uh, for example, Scandinavia, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, labor market flexibility despite having what many people would think of as a socialist uh, system. Even in the kafala system, uh, there's been more flexibility uh, introduced. So some of these, like, uh, you know, the bankruptcy law, the UAE's introduced the bankruptcy law, you need some back infrastructure on that, you need to have credit rating, you need to have, it's, it's not easy, uh, but there are ways to do it, and we're starting to see, you know, the more progressive governments in the region tackling some of these uh, issues uh, head on. No, none of them, you know, every one of these is really a journey. None of them is one that you can just tick off and say, done. 
uh, and there's always scope for more improvement. But for many of the countries in the region and some of the bigger population countries in the region, they haven't even started to tackle these yet. And so this is really the us as the private sector saying, you're, you're saying you want us to do more and employ more and invest more. There's a lot of private capital in the region. These are some things that would really help unlock that potential for mutual benefit. And we're willing to work with uh, governments in the region um, to activate some of these. Could we, sorry, could, could you repeat the question with the mic? Uh, I mean, I mean, is, is this some kind of ultimatum from the private sector? No, I, no. I, you know, you the private sector is, is, is investing. We're all investing. And, and, and actually, you know, I share the minister's optimism for the region. The, the outlook is very positive. And if we can turn this youth bulge into a resource, the way countries like Turkey have managed to do, the way countries like China have managed to do, we can fuel our GDP growth for a long time to come. What we're saying, and, and we've, you know, we've uh, heard it even uh, in the region, that we, and sometimes we've got really good physical infrastructure, but the regulatory infrastructure is like what's holding us back. You know, it's like a, a ball on chain on, on Usain Bolt's leg. <laughs> it's kind of holding, holding back. We could do so much more is the point. Exactly. So this, this is not an ultimatum by any means. This is actually a positive engagement to say this could, these steps, which some of them are, are challenging, but none of them take 20 years, uh, like education reform uh, might take much longer. And these things could really make a quick difference. Thank you very much. We've hopelessly overrun the timing, so um, I don't want to cut everyone or anybody off, but I think we have to come to a close for the press conference here. Um, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for being here, and a uh, uh, warm thank you to everybody here on the panel. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.